on the floor uh, without objection. So ordered, I now recognize myself for three minutes to give an opening statement. Uh, welcome again to our outstanding panel of witnesses. Um, the, the climate crisis has had a brutal impact on our nation this year. Not only did we experience the hottest month on record this summer, we've also had more disasters nine months into this year than in any other year in our history. We've suffered 18 climate-fueled major disasters in 2021, and that has left us with a price tag of over $104 billion in damages. And it's often working families and communities of color that who shoulder the cost. Climate change is also harming America's businesses. Extreme weather events increase uncertainty and instability for workers and entrepreneurs, many of whom are one disaster away from losing their livelihoods. A growing number of companies are taking matters into their own hands, but they cannot do it alone. It's time to chart a better path and build a more equitable and resilient economy. The right climate investments can create millions of good paying jobs, protect small businesses, and ensure prosperity across America. And with the help of America's business leaders, we can make sure this progress is good for both our climate and our economy. Here's the thing, solving the climate crisis will be good for business. That's why car manufacturers are doubling down on electric vehicles and you know, utilities are investing in renewables. America's top business leaders understand that embracing sustainability will help them attract talent and deliver innovative products, which is why more companies are taking action to be part of the solution as we lead global markets towards a clean energy future. Hundreds of global companies have already started setting targets to reduce their corporate emissions, and over 100 companies have goals to eventually run entirely on clean energy. Some major businesses are already at that point running their facilities 100% clean energy and others like those representative, represented by our witnesses here today are doing their part to put us on the right path. We're also seeing the world's leading investors uh, take action. Just this week, the Ford Foundation announced it will stop investing in fossil fuels and instead focus its energy portfolio on renewables. More than 30 other large investors have committed to invest only in companies with targets to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And a global financial alliance to deliver on the promises of the Paris Agreement by leveraging more than $70 trillion in assets. These investors understand that climate action is good for business. Uh, moving our economy toward clean energy is an economic imperative. We know climate progress means millions of good paying jobs it also means increased innovation, boosted cost savings, and improved investor confidence. So I look forward to today's discussion. The chair now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Graves of Louisiana, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to thank you for holding this hearing today and for the witnesses for your participation. Uh, Madam Chair, as we've discussed at many of these hearings, it, it is important that we take action, but it's important that we take action that is, that is science-based, that's evidence-based. Uh, what uh, much of the of the of the folks who pontificate on on climate change and clean energy policy have been talking about in recent years, excuse me, recent months, has been this this clean energy plan that's included in the reconciliation package. Yet, when you look at <clears throat> excuse me, when you look at the actual policies that are embedded in there, even independent reviews by Congressional Research Service have found that this does not guarantee that we're going to be moving in the right direction. But it does guarantee higher prices for all consumers. Madam Chair, as we move forward in a direction of a clean energy future, we must do it. We must do it in a way that is based upon evidence. And you look back, for example, at the Clean Power Plan. Um, the Clean Power Plan, Madam Chair, what we did is we, we, we lifted the restrictions. We lifted the, the sanctions. We didn't put mandates on energy companies, yet they took an objective that was set um, uh, for 2030. And during the Trump administration, we were able to hit that target uh, in 2019, to hit that target 11 years early, not just hit it, but exceed it. And, and Madam Chair, you know that that, that that target, you know how much we subsidized, do you know how much we mandated, do you know how much we, we required of companies to, to actually hit that target uh, at all or hit it much less 11 years early? 
zero. There were no mandates. There were no restrictions. We let innovators innovate. And so, Madam Chair, we don't need a, a, a clean energy plan and a reconciliation package. What we need to do is we need to build upon the successes. We need to learn from the failures of the past and realize that the best way for us to move forward in a, in a clean energy direction is we must, we must let innovators innovate. Don't come in and, and restrict it to certain technologies. That has not resulted in the outcomes that we need. And most importantly, Madam Chair, and I hope this is something that we can all agree on, as we uh, uh, head to the, to the Convention of Parties in, in Scotland, is that I hope that we can all agree upon what we need to be doing is we need to be focusing upon the global, the global outcomes here and stop looking myopically at the United States as though we can solve all the world's problems. We need to make sure that China is held accountable in an enforceable mechanism and in a way that we, we result not in increasing four tons of, of emissions for every one ton the U.S., uh, reduces, but but actually results in global emissions going down. That needs to be the end zone. That needs to be the objective of, of the COP. And that means holding countries like China accountable to doing something to move in the right direction, not to increase our emissions by 50% over the next nine years. Uh, so, Madam Chair, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and yield back. Thank you very much. Now we'll welcome our witnesses, and I encourage members to, to go and vote and return for their testimony and questions. First, we'll go to Representative Kasten to introduce David Etsy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm pleased to introduce David Etsy, who is the Climate Director for Zurich North America, where he leads the development of insurance and service solutions to address climate change mitigation and adaptation. I should give a plug to Zurich here that one of your great competencies is you had the wisdom to hire my wife for many years, who has, of course, moved on to other things since, uh, so no current conflicts. David has expertise in climate change risk, mitigation, and resilience strategies with more than 25 years of experience in insurance and litigation. For over a century, Zurich North America's corporate headquarters has been in the greater Chicago area. And in 2016, Zurich moved closer to my own district in suburban Schaumburg, where they employ over 53,000 people. As future climate events are projected, projected to cause a $1.2 trillion loss to the U.S. economy, and as more companies are experiencing more intensity and variability from extreme weather events that impact production capacity and operational costs, David offers a valuable perspective on how the private sector can play a role in determining short-term climate risk and identify opportunities to implement mitigation and adaptation actions. Thank you, David, for being here, and I look forward to hearing more about Zurich's work. Next, we'll go to uh, the chair recognizes Representative Brownlee to introduce Corley Kenna. Thank you, Madam Chair. And as I made a promise, I will be brief, but I am delighted to introduce uh, Ms. Corley Kenna today from uh, Patagonia. As Ms. Kenna outlined in her testimony, Patagonia has learned has leaned in on the climate challenges confronting businesses as the, as the plant warms and extreme weather events that threaten supply chains. Patagonia was founded by Yvonne and Melinda Chouinard, who are two of the truest champions of the environment and the greatest stewards of our country's natural resources. I'm so proud uh, to have Patagonia in my congressional district. Patagonia offers paid leave, on-site child care, flexible work schedules, and competitive wages and benefits. They have always been a forward-looking uh, company. Patagonia is absolutely proof that corporations can be both good stewards of the environment, good to their workers, good for their communities, while still making a reasonable profit producing high quality products. So uh, with, with that, Madam Speaker, we, we thank Ms. Kenna for her testimony and looking forward to it today. I yield back. Welcome, Ms. Kenna, and uh, thank you, Rep. Brownlee. Next, we'll go to uh, Representative McEachin to introduce Gilbert Campbell. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my pl pleasure and privilege to introduce to the committee Mr. Gilbert Campbell. He is the founder and CEO of Volt Energy Utility a national renewable energy firm that finances and develops utility-scale solar and energy storage projects. He also co-founded Volt Energy, a minority-owned and operated dis distrib distribution generation solar development company, and serves on the board of the Solar Energy Industry Association and the American Association of Blacks in, in, in Energy. Lastly, but certainly not least, Mr. Campbell received the White House Champions of Change Award from President Obama for his advocacy promoting the inclusion in the clean energy sector 
and providing STEM education opportunities for young people across the country. Uh, he's received numerous other awards for his work to make the energy sector more equitable and more diverse. Mr. Campbell, my friend, it is good to see you today. Thank you for appearing. I look forward to your testimony. Thank you, thank you, Rep. McKeachin. Next, we'll go to Ranking Member Graves to introduce Mark. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, honored to introduce um, the Honorable Mark Menzies, um, who happens to be from the great state of Louisiana, Hanville, if I remember right, or at least Hanville High. Um, uh, what is better than being a graduate of LSU, doing it two times over? He's a, a two times LSU grad. I had the honor of working with um, with, with uh, Secretary Menzies as, on the Energy and Commerce Committee as he served as, as Chief Energy Counsel for the for the committee. Uh, but he went on in, in, in advising many private sector clients on elect energy and electricity policy and um, served as Deputy Secretary Secretary of the Department of Energy uh, under the previous administration, and just a fantastic guy, a good friend. And um, when he takes that mask off, you're going to see an amazing resemblance to Henry Winkler, as uh, he looks a lot like um, the Fonz. <laughs> well, thank you for that, uh, Ranking Member Graves. Without objection, the witnesses' written statements will be made part of the record. Uh, Ms. Kenna, we're going to start with you. You are now recognized to give a five-minute presentation of your testimony. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Chairwoman Caster, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the committee. Uh, and I really appreciate that kind introduction, Representative Brownlee, um, and this opportunity to speak before the committee. My name is Corley Kenna, and I lead the communications and policy team at Patagonia. Patagonia is a $1 billion business with brick and mortar stores in 19 states and 2,000 employees in the U.S., 3,000 globally. We partner with hundreds of small and large businesses in every single state in the country. And we're a part of an outdoor industry that generates nearly $800 billion in revenue each year and supports more than 7 million jobs. And we help improve mental and physical well being. But more than that, we're a community. We are hikers and hunters, surfers and anglers. We are bikers and birders, climbers and skiers. We live in urban and rural areas and we vote for liberals and conservatives. The one thing that we all have in common is our love for the outdoors and a desire for clean air clean water, and a healthy planet. The climate crisis is not an abstract theory. It is an urgent threat to our business and our community. To paraphrase conservationist David Brower, there is no business to be done on a dead planet. Extreme temperatures, wildfires, polluted air, warming winters, eroded coastlines, and dried up rivers prevent our community from exploring and enjoying the outdoors. They also threaten our operations. Just this year, we had to close our uh, distribution center in Reno because of bad air quality caused by wildfires exacerbated by the climate crisis. In 2017, we had to shut down our headquarters for a whole month because of what was then California's largest wildfire. And just as we have an interest in acting because our business and community is affected by this crisis, we recognize we have a responsibility to act because every part of our business contributes to the climate crisis. Our supply chains and our financial partners rely on fossil fuels, the same fossil fuels that are destroying the planet we all depend on. Patagonia is working to reduce and eliminate our scope three carbon emissions. And we are proud that in just four years, we won't use any virgin petroleum fiber sources in our materials. We have donated nearly $150 million to thousands of groups working on the most pressing environmental challenges. And we use our brand voice to advocate for solutions to the climate crisis. But Patagonia and other companies committed to aggressive carbon reductions can't do this alone. There are simply some things that only government can do. The Build Back Better Act offers a bold and urgent opportunity to address the climate crisis before it's too late and to give working families the support that they deserve. 
the climate investments of this budget reconciliation package would accelerate the clean energy economy, create thousands of new jobs, and promote greater climate resilience by conserving our public lands. These are not wish list items, but critical actions needed to stave off impending climate disaster. Patagonia is willing to pay a higher corporate tax rate to fund this critical legislation. But we also urge Congress to eliminate tax subsidies for oil and gas companies. The United States spends $20 billion annually uh, subsidizing fossil fuels. It's time to shift those investments to a clean and just future for people and planet. This is the defining challenge of our era. The good news for Congress is that not only is this legislation needed, but it is popular among your constituents and the climate investments in particular are supported by many in the American business community. Special interests can spend millions of dollars to lobby against the bill, but make no mistake, the American people want to see these game-changing investments in our planet and our future. They want to see it happen before it's too late. So thank you again for this opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Kenna. Mr. Campbell, you are now recognized for five minutes to, for a presentation of your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Chairwoman Castor, uh, Ranking Member Grace, I have to step out for the vote. Members of the Select Committee, I'm honored to sit before you today to testify on today's hearing, Good for Business, the Private Sector Perspectives on Climate Action. As Congressman McKeesha mentioned, I am the co-founder of a company called Bold Energy. I started the company 10 years ago to develop rooftop solar and solar carports for companies all across this country, ranging from the Cheesecake Factory, its corporate headquarters in California, to projects in Colorado with Subaru. But we work with a lot of underrepresented community projects as well. We work with a lot of historically black colleges and universities. We also work with churches, synagogues, and other uh, faith institutions across the country to make sure that they're able to reduce their carbon footprint uh, with, with solar energy. I am here today to show why I strongly support the Build Better Act. While I'm a small business owner, um, while I'm here as a small business owner to talk about the financial implications that it's having, the climate disaster is having on businesses, I'm here as a concerned citizen first. Um, I know how divided our nation is on pretty much everything. And I'm an eternal optimist, but I really hope the climate crisis, as it was mentioned earlier, it really is the, the opportunity for us to really tackle the biggest crisis our world is facing. Um, this really shouldn't be viewed as a red or blue partisan issue. I truly hope that we can view this as a red, white, and blue opportunity to lead on a global stage for the biggest issue, again, facing our nation and the world. What are uh, ranking, I'm assuming, uh, Congressional Member Graves talked about uh, let innovators innovate. At Volt Energy Utility, which is a utility scale company that I founded, that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, what we are doing currently, we've created this concept called the Environmental Justice Power Purchase Agreement. And through a power purchase agreement is how most corporations buy renewable energy. And one of the things that we wanted to do differently was we understand the importance of environmental justice and tackling environmental justice. What is the term? What does environmental justice mean? It's defined as the fair and equitable distribution of both environmental burden and environmental benefit. For far too long, communities of color and rural communities have been on the wrong side of that ledger, only dealing with the environmental burden, but have not participated with the environmental benefit. Our environmental justice power purchase agreement we work with some of the largest companies in the world. We just recently announced a large project with Microsoft where the concept is this. We cannot develop utility scale solar projects in places like Washington, D.C., in Baltimore, um, in Philadelphia, in New York City, and a lot of inner cities across the country. We don't have the space to develop large utility scale projects. What we can do is develop those projects, which has been done all throughout the country in rural areas. Our focus is on a concept called emissionality where we're looking to develop projects where the grid um, is the dirtiest. We want to be able to clean up. And why is that so important? To improve health outcomes for people who live in those communities. However, we can't lose sight of the other communities, minority communities that have suffered for so long with energy burden and environmental um, 
injustices. So we are taking a percentage of our revenue and, and partnership with our the corporations we work with to make investments in communities of color to address environmental health, to address economic justice, to create a pipeline of students coming out of HBCUs that will take on these jobs of the future. But we can't do this alone. We need the federal government to support the work that we're doing to tackle climate change. This is an effort that can be a public-private partnership and really get us back out. We're coming out of a time in our nation where we're coming out of COVID, an unprecedented uh, pandemic. People are looking to get back to work. Climate change is that solution. It's the biggest issue, again, that we're facing. And my business colleagues, I had the opportunity to be part of a press event re recently, and we talked about how um, climate change is, is making the supply chain very difficult for businesses to do what we do, to order the materials that we need to develop the projects that we do. I will also note that over a thousand business leaders have signed uh, letters of support for Build Back Better. The American Sustainable Business Council, E2, and Clean Energy for America have organized letters from businesses calling on Congress to pass historic investments through reconciliation to combat climate change. In closing, not only does climate change pose a threat to our economy and our communities, this issue transcends race or politics, whatever one lives in the city, suburbs, rural communities. It already adds to disproportionate burdens on communities of color, and the Build Better Act is essential to mitigating these harms, to providing important opportunities that advance job creation here at home, U.S. competitiveness abroad, and environmental equity across our country. For all these reasons, I strongly support the legislation. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts on the Build Better Act. Well, thank you, Mr. Campbell. Next, we'll go to Mr. Mendez. Uh, you're now recognized for five minutes. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Castor, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the Select Committee. Uh, Select Committee. Uh, thank you for the invitation to testify before you uh, this afternoon. I appear before you as a private citizen not in any official capacity, and my testimony is my own. Uh, my testimony will be on the Clean Electricity Performance Program, commonly referred to as the SEP, that is part of the Budget Reconciliation Package pending before Congress. As has been reported, the SEP was created for two reasons. One, as a mechanism to comply with the Senate's Byrd Rules restrictions against policy changes in the budget reconciliation process, and two, to compel electric utilities to add clean electricity within its tight scoring window. I submit the SEP is a solution to a Senate process problem and not an emissions problem. It's unnecessary for two reasons. One, the electric sector leads all other sectors in actual quantifiable emission reductions since 2000. These reductions are the reason the US leads all other countries in actual reductions since 2000. Two, the electric sector is viewed as the solution, not the problem, to reducing our nation's emissions. All comprehensive plans to obtain emission reductions or net zero goals call for greater electrification of the economy. As Congress incents our mandates, the electrification of sectors of the economy, utilities will have to increase generation to meet the increased demand. Is the SEP, which penalizes utilities unable to meet clean electricity requirements, a rational reaction? The SEP requires all electric utilities, co-ops, munis, and the investor-owned utilities to increase their clean electricity by 4% each year from 2023 to 2030 or pay the government $40 for every megawatt hour below its mandated target. To say this is a very aggressive timetable is an understatement. The average rate nationwide of bringing new renewable generation online is 1% per year over the past 10 years. As I've said, reconciliation rules do not allow for a longer timeline of compliance. And it's quite possible to set if enacted as drafted would make electricity less reliable, potentially increase cost to consumers, and do not, mu do, not do much to improve the environment. Now, why do I say that? Uh, with the SEP's relatively short timeline for compliance, the only clean electricity source is likely to be solar, which as an intermittent resource does not assure reliability. I have been unable to find any review of the SEP by either NERC or FERC, those entities mandated by Congress to develop, implement, and enforce the electric reliability standards of our nation's bulk power system. Considering the great concern expressed by Congress just this year about electric reliability in California, Texas, and elsewhere, 
One would wonder why Congress hasn't insisted on getting views from those with the statutory obligations to keep our grid reliable. The CRS points out that the SEP will put compliance costs on federal taxpayers as well as electricity consumers. It estimates it will cost federal taxpayers $150 billion over 10 years. Now, true, the grants in the SEP are intended to reduce costs to ratepayers so they do not bear the direct cost of this transition to clean electricity. However, as the CRS points out, no one really knows for certain who will bear the expected cost and how much. In the long run, consumers might pay more. Imagine explaining to grandma living on fixed income why she has to pay more to meet the SEP requirements. Nor is it apparent that the SEP will do much for the environment. Indeed, as the CRS points out, the SEP does not guarantee reductions. The CRS alerts members of Congress that under the SEP, electric, electric utilities may face cost or other constraints such as siting challenges, state and local regulatory requirements, reliability risks on achieving SEP targets. Plus, utilities might decide to pay the penalty rather than expend the high capital cost to reduce emissions. And were the SEP to be enacted as drafted, it's likely there will be unintended consequences. As the sector adds more and more intermittent renewables to comply with the SEP, more reliable backup power, power will be needed because battery storage capacity can't be built quickly enough. A project underway in California today to add state-of-the-art four-hour battery storage to a 350-megawatt solar project for 2022 started in 20. 15, seven years from start to coming online. Finally, the SEP may very well stop the development of zero emitting nuclear development and CCS deployment. Both nuclear and carbon capture technology simply cannot be permitted and built in time. What happens to the $4.5 billion Louisiana clean energy complex announced last week by Air Products and the governor of Louisiana to use CCS to capture and permanently sequester 5 million tons of carbon a year. What happens to the small modular nuclear reactors being pursued out west that the taxpayers and private industry have spent enormous amounts of resources to develop and deploy? And by the way, the photovoltaics that will cover our landscapes to meet the SEP, very likely buggy technology. Today, our labs have developed disruptive liquid crystalline technologies that could replace today's solar panels with coatings as cheap as paint. You can read about it all in this book. Even John Kerry called this potential that may very well save the earth. Finally, um, all this is not to say there couldn't be improvements to the SEP. It's right that I've offered some suggestions in my written testimony. I thank you and look forward to your questions. I apologize. Thank you for your testimony. Chair now recognizes Mr. Edzi for your prepared remarks. Thank you. I would like to, to thank Chair Castor, Ranking Member Graves, Congressman Kasten for the introduction, and the other members of the committee for inviting me to address you today on this issue of such extreme importance to our entire country and the world. My name is David Edzi, and I'm employed by Zurich North America, one of the largest commercial insurance companies in the U.S. as its climate director a role which my employer created as part of its broader response to climate change. In addition to our casualty and specialty lines of insurance, Zurich insures the commercial properties of thousands of U.S. companies against physical damage caused by flood, windstorm, hail, wildfire, and other extreme weather events. Our property policies also pay for our customers' lost business income resulting from damage to their property, power outage, or damage to their supply chain due to extreme weather events. In short, Zurich, like all other property insurers, is dramatically exposed to extreme weather events, now made more frequent and severe due to anthropogenic climate change. The science of climate change, and in particular, the recent IPCC sixth assessment report, are extremely alarming to Zurich, not only with, with respect to its own exposure, but also due to the potentially devastating impacts to our customers, communities, the economy, our ecosystems, and the humanitarian toll likely to fall upon the most vulnerable on this planet. In response to this threat, Zurich has prioritized helping our policyholders and communities adapt to the effects of climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. For example, in alignment with the Paris Agreement, we have committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2050 in our own operations, in our investment portfolios, and in our underwriting portfolios, and have already made significant progress towards these targets. We are also sponsoring the not-for-profit Instituto Terra, which is restoring nearly 2,000 acres in Brazil's Atlantic forest by planting a million trees and restoring biodiversity. We are also collaborating with the Resilient Cities Network to create a multi-year program to strengthen climate resilience 
and address social inequities in vulnerable communities, beginning initially with Houston and Boston. Zurich has made and embarked on many other climate related commitments and initiatives, including maintaining a prominent presence at the upcoming COP26 conference in Glasgow. And of course, Zurich is not alone amongst companies making net zero emission commitments or financial companies committing to climate impact investment. But the commitments from industry and commerce, though impressive and growing, will not be enough to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 in order to keep global warming in check. Decisive governmental action is needed. As Zurich recently stated in our Closing the Gap on Climate white paper, certainty around political commitment to net zero and the policy actions that will implement those commitments are fundamental to making progress. Without this clarity, it will be difficult to make the investment case for new low carbon technologies or to create the pipeline of investable green projects required to really scale green financial markets. Zurich therefore applauds the important work of all of the members of this committee and its staff in developing recommendations on the policies needed to solve the climate crisis. Transforming our society on the scale required to meet this challenge will be monumental. To align with science to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, broad and bold public policies need to be enacted that will enable a reduction of our greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. And so it is urgent that we put those policies in place now. As Congress considers climate legislation, Zurich supports a clean electricity program as the foundation of a net zero economy is a clean grid to meet the growing demands of electrified vehicles, buildings, and industries. We further support the extension of tax credits, supporting the use of renewable electricity and the purchase of electric vehicles. We also support public investments in EV charging infrastructure, green hydrogen, and carbon capture and storage. Zurich has also long held that a meaningful global price on carbon is the most efficient way to achieve net zero outcomes. Done correctly, a price on carbon would allow economic incentives to reduce emissions. The response to this crisis cannot be overdone and will require the combined efforts of all citizens, communities, businesses, and levels of government. It will also require an unprecedented level of international cooperation especially to advance emerging economies onto carbon-free platforms, to protect the world's natural carbon sinks, and to share carbon reporting and pricing mechanisms. Thank you again for allowing me to address you this afternoon, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank to all the witnesses. Uh, the chair will now recognize Ms. Bonamici uh, for three minutes of questions. Uh, thank you, Acting Chair Kasten and Chair Castor and Ranking Member Graves. But thank you, especially to the witnesses. I've read all of your testimony and I appreciate that you're here today. A study released in September by the Department of Energy's Solar Energy Technologies Office and National Renewable Energy Laboratory found that with the proper policies in place, solar energy could make up 40% of the US power sector by 2035, which is a 13-fold increase over the current proportion of solar-powered electricity. The study also projected an increase in total solar energy jobs from 230,000 in 2021 to up to 1.5 million by 2035. To phase out fossil fuels and spur the job growth needed to achieve such an increase, we must rapidly increase investment in workforce de development. Over the past few decades, investment in the public workforce development system has declined significantly. And currently the system is not prepared to train the thousands, if not millions of new industry professionals in the renewable energy uh, industries who will be an important part of reaching our decarbonization goals. So last week I led a letter with 35 of my colleagues in support of preserving as much workforce development as po funding as possible in the Build Back Better Act, robust funding, which is important, that will increase uh, career counseling, career and technical education on the job training programs, including registered apprenticeships. So making this investment is a priority in the Build Back Better Act, and it's necessary to facilitate this transition to a green economy, help meet our nation's decarbonization goals, and importantly, create good paying jobs. So my question is, Mr. Campbell, uh, what are your current workforce challenges at Bold Energy? And on the broader solar sector, how do you expect these challenges to compound as the transition to renewable energy accelerates? And what can Congress do to build a diverse clean energy workforce? 
Thank you, Congresswoman. All great questions. And I just want to first add on a little bit to what you said about the 40 percent. Um, there was a recent DOE study that said if we get to 100 percent decarbonation by 2035, um, that we it will require solar to get to between 40 and 45 percent. But let's talk about where solar is now. Solar only accounts for 4 percent of our nation's electricity generation, but it accounts for 100,000 businesses in the solar industry, including mine. It also accounts for 230,000 plus Americans with good paying jobs working in the solar industry. So we're at 4% now, 100,000 businesses, 230 plus thousand employees. We get the 40%. What is the growth as far as wealth creation? What is the growth as far as jobs? We cannot afford not to make these investments. And specifically the question as far as some of the workforce challenges that we're facing, we're scaling our business. We're putting our money where our mouth is. We are hiring a lot of people to help us address environmental justice, even though you know our core business is developing solar projects. But one of the challenges that we are facing is we are looking to hire people that look like America. And for far too long, uh, communities of color have not been engaged in this space. And it is really hard to find diverse talent in this space. So I part appreciate of what that, Mr. Campbell. Unfortunately, my short time has expired, but I appreciate that and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you and apologies to all for our short timing, but I appreciate your flexibility. Um, uh, the Chair will now recognize Mr. Graves for a far too brief three minutes. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Mr. Menzies, Secretary Menzies, I want to thank you again for coming in my opening statement and your testimony. You, you talked about this, this SEP uh, effort in the reconciliation package. You, you led the agency under um, this extraordinary reduction, again, beating targets that were set by the Obama administration. Can, can you talk a little bit about the strategy that y'all used to do that and how, if, if you were given a magic wand, how you would sort of chart a course moving forward in, in a clean energy direction? Uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Grace, for the question. Yeah, at the DOE, we had a, we had a policy. Uh, you remember, we're in the executive branch. Um, and it was um, innovation over regulation. We certainly had options to issue regulations, EPA does, uh, Department of Interior, but generally we took uh, the view to get out of the way and, and to focus on really developing the technologies. We were all of the above. Uh, we, got, we were very excited about all the technologies. Um, we saw industry, um, consumers, people were moving in the direction of green energy. There were many opportunities. Look at all that we have accomplished. We've accomplished so much in the electricity sector uh, without a carbon tax, without a mandate, that it's almost hard for the government to catch up with what's going on. So research uh, and development dollars, basic research. Um, we talk about this uh, technology in solar. Solar's a, a great thing. We have a lot of sun. The problem that we have, and we got to really focus on, is as much of intermittent renewables we have, whether it's solar, which is fantastic, wind, Still, you need ramping technology. Now, everybody's saying we got battery technology, and that's why I referred to what's going on in California. We are building, it's four hour battery. That's the state of the technology there. So our national labs, indeed universities, everybody is trying to figure out how to get at least 10 hours of battery. And that's, that's the challenge. But when we get there, it may be breakthrough technology. It may not be the lithium ions. It may be new technologies but it's really an exciting opportunity, but we're simply not there yet to be able to, I think, withstand the SEP, which really confines things to a very small uh, window. Yes or no, do you think if the SEP were enacted, it would result in higher energy prices, electricity prices for those uh, making less than 400,000 Well, that's what the CRS seems to be alerting Congress to because we really don't know who's ultimately gonna bear the cost. We do know that it's both the, the taxpayers uh, and ratepayers. Thank you. Um, I just have a little bit of time left. Ms. Kenna, I'm, I'm curious, would Patagonia uh, support uh, a federal certification uh, for no slave labor as a condition of, of federal subsidies as it comes to a clean energy future? Excuse me. Sorry. Thank you. Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you for your question. Um, I My sense is, is you're asking a question about uh, the situation in China with the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And Patagonia actually made a decision um, early last year to uh, stop sourcing altogether, stop sourcing cotton altogether from- uh, um 
that region and just want to get back to why we're here today, which is that the business community supports investments in climate. And we need it both so that we can, um, as I understand from your staff, that you like to get outdoors and have fun. Our community does too. We need these investments so that we can recreate, have fun outside, and because they're critical to our bottom line. Yeah, and Ms. Kona, I know I'm out of time, but I just wanted to clarify, I wasn't speaking about Patagonia's own materials or products I'm talking about for energy products, but, but we can clarify that on the record. Uh, thank you for your answer. Thank you. And uh, Representative Kasten, you are recognized for five minutes. Representative Kasten was surprised. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <laughs> um, Mr. Menzies, I want to thank you for your testimony. And I want to start with um, two points you raised that I totally agree with. Um, number one, we have to push to electrify everything as quick as we can, um, or as much as we can to decarbonize. And number two, that will require a rate of decarbonization and deployment of renewables beyond anything we have ever achieved. Um, I agree. The reason that we've done that is because our job today is not to justify delay or make excuses for an action. I think our predecessors have set that bar too high. We've run out of time and we have to act. And so I would urge us all to be inspired by both the fact that we, we electrified rural America in a decade. Um, as Condoleezza Rice says, our job is to make the impossible seem inevitable in retrospect. So let's not be constrained by our ambition. Let's get it done. Two points of yours I disagree with are the reliability and the price. Um, France, Ontario, Canada, a couple Scandinavian countries have all achieved over 80% clean energy without any decrement in reliability. Would you, would you agree with that? Scandinavian Two Scandinavian countries. The, I mean, Ontario did this in, in basically a decade. They decided to get rid of their coal and I haven't seen any hiccups in the Ontario grid. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not aware of any studies on that, but I'm happy to look at them. You, you know, I haven't seen a lot of newspaper reports about outages in Ontario. Um, let's, let's at least be more ambitious in Ontario. On the question of pricing, um, you know, you, you got experience in the coal industry. How many must-run hours does a typical coal plant have where they, they would shut off if they, if they could because of the economics, but they can't afford to dial it back and are losing money for their shareholders every hour for typical coal plant? Yeah, well, I, I don't know the exact number, but... Um, yeah, with the low cost natural gas, I mean, coal plants basically were taken offline and they were reserved and must run capacity, but they weren't running in the energy markets. Um, yeah, and the capacity factors down. You said low cost natural gas. Is the capacity factor of the gas fleet lower or higher than the nuke fleet? Then the combined cycle units? The combined cycle yes. units are, are more efficient than the coal. Are they that, than the nuclear fleet, which has a higher capacity factor, the nuclear fleet or the combined cycle fleet? Uh, the, the nuclear fleet. Yeah, because it's cheaper, right? Well, it runs 96 are, you, are you aware? Are you aware of anybody who owns a solar panel or a wind turbine or a geothermal plant or a hydro plant who wakes up in the morning and says, "I better check to see if it makes sense for me to run today"? Only when elect, only when uh, consumers need the electricity is when they really absolutely have to have it. And so, what we find is that when the when the system is stressed is when they need it, not when they want it. And it's we need to design our, uh, uh, design our system to be able to produce that electricity when it's needed the most. Well, and I guess what I'd suggest and is- that prices don't go through the roof, right? Well, let's be very clear. As you mentioned, we have NERC, we have FERC to cover the reliability. They do an excellent job and I trust them. Every time we build a zero carbon energy asset, we build a plant that does not require fossil fuel to run and it has driven down the cost of energy. I know that because that was my entire career and we are on the cusp of the greatest wealth transfer in our history from the energy producing sector to energy consumers. Let's get out of the way and run forward. Thank you and I yield back. Thank you. Rep. Kasten yields back. Uh, I don't know if Rep. Gonzalez is on or not. Otherwise we will go to uh, Rep. Miller. You're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Chair Castor and Ranking Member Graves, and thank you to all y'all for being here today. I want to echo the thoughts of several of my colleagues and note the Clean Energy Performance Program is a performative agenda pushed by liberal activists. I applaud my colleague, Senator Manchin, from my home state of West Virginia, for seeing through what the SEP pretends to offer and understanding that wind and solar energy generation cannot and will not ever have the ability to power our country on its own. SEP, as currently written, would rob investment in these future technologies as only a small sliver of so-called renewables would be eligible for these government handouts, incentivizing some technologies and companies over others. 
I have long been a proponent of an all of the above energy policy that takes into account the necessity to use fossil fuels to ensure Americans have affordable baseload power while continuing to innovate in technologies that bring them closer and closer to carbon neutral. While I appreciate the lofty goals set by many of my colleagues, I often find myself pondering the practicality of implementing their grand visions and have found myself living around communities that have been destroyed by the good intentioned ambitions of government leaders. McDowell County, located in my district of Southern West Virginia, is one of those communities. Once a thriving area with a population well over 100,000 people, it was obliterated by former President Obama war on coal. Now there are in the teens, less than 20,000 people that remain in McDowell County, where the costs of their daily lives only continue to rise as out of control inflation continues to take hold and rising gas prices cuts into their paychecks for every mile they now have to drive to jobs in neighboring counties and states. While some of my colleagues on this committee today may see that West Virginia is irrelevant, bless your heart, I would like you to note that our small but mighty state is the fifth largest energy producer, and you're welcome for keeping your lights on this winter. Mr. Menzies, could you briefly explain how enhanced oil recovery works and how this process can create carbon negative oil and gas? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman, for the question. I need I made reference to the carbon capture technologies that may be at risk if SEP goes uh, into play right now. Congress has enacted the 45Q tax credits and what carbon uh, capture utilization storage um, uh, allows to happen is um, you can take captured carbon and you can uh, push it down into uh, oil fields or formations that have been essentially uh, depleted or at least what was able to get out of them um, you know, when you first took the oil out. So there's a plenty underground uh, in those formations. You take the, the, uh, the captured carbon and you, you pump it down essentially into those wells and it brings additional oil up. And while it does, some of it stays uh, in. Uh, when it comes up, um, that, that carbon that is with the oil is separated and put back down in. And it's con constantly recycled so that over time there is more captured carbon that stays down and is permanently sequestered in that oil field than it is in producing um, the barrel of oil. Um, and the emissions are offset uh, over time, then it's basically it, it's a negative uh, emissions um, uh, outcome. Is her time up? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Get Rebecca. Uh, next, we'll go to Congresswoman Brownlee. You're recognized for three minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Kenna, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, first is, why should the business community really care about passing climate legislation? Sorry about that. Thank you. Thanks so much for that question. Um, the business community should does care about climate investments, and in particular, these climate investments, because frankly, the cost of inaction is not an option. Um, the costs are only going to go up, and already we are seeing um, the effects of this climate crisis. It is affecting our ability to enjoy and recreate outside, and it is affecting our bottom line. And as a business that's part of an $800 billion industry, we need a healthy planet, both so we can get outside and do our business. Well, thank you for that. And you, you mentioned your bottom line, and could you elaborate a little bit more on uh, why a climate investment is important to your bottom line and to others and their bottom line? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, uh, our company is made up of people who like to get outside and we were founded for that reason. And we're still in business today because we fight for those same places to get outside um, as a business that's been also engaged on protecting these places. We know that 
um, that public lands contribute immensely to the health and economic vitality of local communities from the ecosystem services of clean water and air to healthy communities for kids and families to the recreation um, and outdoor industry that we're a part of. Uh, national parks, national wildlife refuge, monuments, and other lands and waters, they account for $45 billion in economic output and nearly 400,000 jobs nationwide, many of which are in communities in rural areas and with close proximity to, to public lands. Um, this Build Back Better Act offers a bold and urgent opportunity to address this crisis and support our bottom line. Thank you for that, and I certainly thank Patagonia for their investments in our nation's outdoors, our nation's uh, public lands. Um, you, you've certainly played your part. Um, last question uh, quickly is, um, if you could talk just a little bit about um, you know, embracing renewable energy in your facilities. Are you, if you are, where are you? If you could talk a little bit about that for a minute. Yeah, for nice great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great question. So we are um, in our owned and operated facilities. Absolutely. We are very near to having 100% reliance on renewable energy in your district. You've seen probably our campus. We have solar panels here, but the bulk of our emissions comes from our supply chain and we are committed to reducing our emissions all, all the way through. Um, we are also using the whole of business approach to push on um, our community and our policy makers to advance community-driven solutions to support a transition to renewable energy and nature-based climate solutions. Terrific. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I invite the committee to go visit a forward-thinking company in my district and visit Patagonia. Love Ventura County. Uh, <laughs> I, I you, yield back. Uh, next, uh, Representative Gonzalez, you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to start with Ms. Kenna and Mr. Campbell. Uh, just some, some quick yes or no's. Um, I think you've said already today, we, you believe we need bold, urgent action to stop climate change today, correct? Yes. 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 Um, yes or no, do you support a $27 billion investment for grid infrastructure? Yes. Yes. What about $21.5 billion investment for clean energy demonstrations to research carbon capture? Not as well versed on carbon capture, so I can't opine on that. Okay. Energy demonstration, clean energy demonstration projects, though, generally? Uh, generally, I would say yes. Okay. Uh, yes or no, $6 billion investment to support the existing civil nuclear fleet? No. No, not, not fans of nuclear? No. Okay, I guess that would make sense considering the, the business model. Um, I, I uh, respectfully disagree on that. Um, having said that, I, I wanted to go through that primarily um, to, well, and then one final thing for, for Ms. Kenna. You said the cost of inaction on climate goes up with each passing day, correct? Yes. So it, mostly yes answers to those questions. So I guess my, my thought is what justification could there possibly be for my Democratic colleagues and for those who believe we need bold, urgent climate action and the cost of an action goes up with each passing day, not to put up a bipartisan infrastructure package today, which has the exact investments that I just outlined. I see no possible logic. Uh, if you're gonna sit here and argue that every day we waste is a day that climate gets worse, when we have a bipartisan package that we could put up, it would pass, I think, I hope. Uh, I would vote for it, um, and uh, and we need to do that. Um, Mr. Campbell, I'm going to stay with you and talk about inflation for a second. The solar sector has not been immune to the supply chain disruptions and rising commodity prices. Price of silicon, for example, has increased 300% in just the past few months. One of the pillars of the SEP would incentivize utilities to go green by rewarding them for shifting to wind and solar energy. If the bill only stimulates demand for solar panels, but doesn't solve the under, underlying supply chain issues, wouldn't that further drive up inflation? Um, possibly, but I, Congressman Gonzalez, I would also like to highlight, when I started my company in 2009, um, we're, take a step back, we're developing a 139 megawatt project in Missouri, which will cost us about $160 million to build. 11 years ago, that would have cost us over $900 million to build. So due to smart climate legislation, 
uh, the cost of solar has drastically come down. But like any other industry, we're not immune to inflation. Right. And the raw material silicon, though, that has gone up by 300 percent, the raw material. I, I am not aware of that fact, Congressman. Okay. I, I cite the, the statistics on that. My bottom line is we have, we have urgent climate action. We need to make the investment. We should put up the bipartisan infrastructure package, which a lot of people agree on. And secondly, we can't be immune to inflation. We can't be spending $3.5 trillion when the economy is already overheating. It's horribly irresponsible. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Rep. Gonzalez. Mr. I'll recognize myself for uh, three minutes for questions. Mr. Edsey, you, you've testified that insurers are increasingly thinking about their exposures um, because we're, these, these extreme climate fueled weather events are are just coming more frequently, they're more costly. And it's not just insurers, it's it's my neighbors back home in Florida, our property insurance rates, flood insurance, and people now are connecting it to the climate crisis. So tell us how federal action would really help us address this, this the increasing cost of climate when it comes to insurance rates. Sure, thank you, Chairman Kasser. Thank you. Um, you, you know, We've done studies that uh, every dollar spent on on building up resiliency saves five dollars in in post uh, event repair work. Um, so certainly, any investment that that from the public sector, from the private sector, into fortifying properties against climate change and, and increased flood and increased hurricanes um, are are going to you know save money down the line. Um, you know, being an insurance company, we are in the business of assessing risk and managing risk, helping our customers manage that risk, uh, helping our customers mitigate the risk. Um, so we take the science of climate change very seriously. And so when you look at mitigation, the, the, the efforts that, that we could take as a society and the world in investing in lowering greenhouse gas emissions is going to be the, the, the most valuable investment we can make at this time in order to lessen the, the severe weather uh, effects of climate change in the future. And those costs on businesses and consumers alike. So reducing greenhouse gases, we'd also, we also think that lo local communities need additional tools to help build resiliency. I remember I was a young lawyer working for the state of Florida after Hurricane Andrew, and at that time the state of Florida stepped up and they improved their building codes. And it was kind of held up over time as a very important move. It, it probably has saved businesses and consumers costs over time, but now those codes and standards haven't kept up. What's what's important for the federal government to do to partner with local communities to make sure we have the appropriate building codes and standards in place? Definitely, whatever the federal government can do to encourage local um, consensus-based, you know, up-to-date standards on building codes is going to help those local communities respond. And in more, more vulnerable areas, um, what should be supported is, is more high hazard risk standards. Um, there's the, the uh, fortified standards and IBHS has uh, fortified standards um, to, to fortify against wildfires and flood. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for putting up with us today on the in and outs. And I wanna thank all of the members for being very efficient. Are there any members who have not had an opportunity to ask a question today? Terrific. Well, I want to thank all of our witnesses. If we can, uh, if you can, can go. Yeah. Why don't we, since Rep. Escobar is coming back from <laughs> the vote, and Mr. Carter is going to, to come on in just a second. Uh, Rep. Bonamici, I'll recognize you for three minutes for an additional question. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I really, well, again, want to thank you all for being here today. And I want to ask Ms. Kenna a question. Uh, I represent a, a district in the Pacific Northwest and the outdoor recreation industries are, are very, very uh, important to our quality of life and to our economy. So I wanted to ask you, Ms. Kenna, in sort of general terms, how has the climate crisis uh, affected your, uh, your, your business, but also uh, once we get on this path to a clean energy economy and address the climate crisis, how will that positively uh, affect your business? Thank you. Yeah, 
Thank you so much for, for that question. I had the pleasure this past weekend of uh, spending some time with some of the ambassadors, the athletes in our communities. These are world-class bikers and skiers and cli climbers, anglers, and they report um, with each year, they are seeing these effects of the climate crisis more and more. And so that that's part of our community. And then of course, there's our bottom line and how we operate our business, our supply chain, our distribution center and our headquarters. As I mentioned in my testimony, we've had to shut down our Reno distribution center several times this year already because of smoky skies from these really severe wildfires. In 2017, our headquarters here in Ventura um, had to shut down for a month. And uh, that was a fire that was here on our campus. Um, the, the time it was the largest one since, and I believe each year since then, we've seen bigger and bigger fires. Um, so without a doubt, this is having an effect on our business and on our community. Thank you. And I, I just want to note that you know, last year we had the horrific wildfires and smoke. This year we had the heat dome where more than 100 people lost their lives in Oregon because of the extreme heat. And I was recently hiking at Mount Hood and I've never seen it uh, more brown. Uh, usually there's snow there and skiing year round. That's not happening now uh, because uh, the temperatures are so high uh, and, and the heat. So thank you so much for your, your testimony. And I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Rep. Bonamici. Next, we'll go to Rep. Gonzalez for a second round of questions. Thank you. Um, I want to start with uh, Ms. Kenna again and, and just talk about the nuclear point a, a, a little bit more. Um, Patagonia thrives and, and is built around the notion that we should all be able to enjoy the outdoors. We should all be able to enjoy the natural habitat. I'm a customer of yours. I, I love your products um, and, uh, and appreciate that mission, and I share it. Um, that being said, the opposition to nuclear strikes me as somewhat misguided. I guess I'd like to hear your thoughts on it more, given that we know for sure that if we put solar and wind all over the country, that there is a natural habitat destruction and a biodiversity problem that you just can't get away from, as far as I know. But I'm curious for your thoughts on that, because my view is that nuclear actually allows you to solve for that. Now, the cost of nuclear is too high. We need, uh, there's a lot we need to do to improve our nuclear infrastructure. I'm working on a lot of those things in a bipartisan way with many of my colleagues. But I'd love to hear from you why Patagonia would be against nuclear, given what we know about the biodiversity challenges associated with solar and wind. Yeah. Thank you, Congressman. It's a, it's a great question. And also, thanks for being a customer. We, we appreciate that. Um, so you're right. Uh, we, we do have a lot of concerns about nuclear, and I am not a nuclear expert. But what I do know is that the waste associated with nuclear is incredibly problematic, and we don't have a solution for it. So that is why we are pushing for investments in wind and solar. And you're right. We need to be mindful about where we are putting windmills and solar fields. And um, it's our point of view, our perspective, uh, that we should take advantage of underutilized areas, um, brownfields and landfills, for instance, would make for great locations for wind and solar. Thank you again for the question. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Respectfully, I, I'm personally more concerned about the biodiversity challenges associated with wind and solar, or, Sorry, yeah, wind and solar, and the waste issues associated with nuclear. I think the nuclear waste issues are are much more solvable, uh, and frankly, have moved a lot further. Um, I just don't know how you throw up solar panels all over the country without destroying the natural habitat, and that concerns me greatly uh, as somebody who who loves the outdoors, who's passionate about climate, uh, and wants to see my kids, my grandkids, have the opportunities to enjoy the outdoors in the same way that that you and I have. Um, yeah. for, for much of our lives. So with that, I, I thank you for clarifying and I yield back. I commend the gentleman for finishing under time. I think that's a first here on this three minute panel. Uh, the chair uh, will now recognize uh, Ms. Escobar on the, uh, on the TV screen. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, really appreciate all of our witnesses who are here today sharing their expertise. And I will be as brief as I can in my question, but first some quick context. Um, we know that uh, the federal government alone nor the private sector alone can do this. We have to achieve um, a, a place 
where we are saving our planet together. That includes consumers, individuals, local governments, you name it. And in my community, we have formed, my office has formed a climate crisis advisory committee. And our focus right now is bringing all parties together, together um, sitting around the same table so that we can uh, ensure that each sector and um, each stakeholder creates a, um, a, a climate action plan. And so Mr. Campbell, um, thank you so much for your work as a uh, leader. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, we're developing our climate action plan and as more communities develop these plans, we really have a tremendous opportunity to ensure that there's equity for minority communities who are frequently left out. My own community is um, economically disadvantaged and about 85% Latino um, and is frequently left out of federal packages. Um, and and local governments don't have a whole lot of money to fund plans like this. Um, but given your leadership in developing the first environmental justice power purchase agreement, how can communities of color plan ahead in order to realize the benefits of a clean energy transition? What are the things you think we need to be looking out for, or planning for? Great question, Congressman Escobar, and thank you for sharing your comments. So. Uh, a couple things. I think first, um, in communities, particularly of color, there needs to be a little bit more um, education around the impacts of, of climate change, um, both to prepare for a resiliency standpoint, but also to understand the opportunities. As I mentioned before, uh, communities of color shouldn't only suffer environmental burden, they shouldn't suffer at all, but they should also participate from environmental um, opportunities. I recently had the opportunity, piggybacking on your point, to speak to um, over 50 students at Howard University two Fridays ago at 4 p.m. Uh, about climate change and solar. I can speak for myself as a graduate of Howard University. When I was in college, I don't think I would have been at, at 4 o'clock on a Friday talking about climate change and, and uh, sustainability. However, these students have a direct ask for the members before this committee and before Congress in general. They want you to invest in their future. They come from communities like yours, Congressman Escobar, where for far too long, you know, they've seen family members suffer from respiratory diseases. That's played out in COVID. Um, they want these investments from Build Back Better to invest in their future to make sure that, A, they're breathing clean air, which would be a fundamental necessity, but they have opportunities to get good career jobs in renewable energy and sustainability and to be able to start their own businesses. So I just ask everyone to be thoughtful of making a down payment for future generations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Mr. Um, Menendez, I, I want to start with you because your testimony pretty much focused on the Clean Electricity Performance Program, SEP. And I have to say that I, I read your testimony and I heard most of it earlier, and I have to agree with you. I think you're you're absolutely spot on here, and I think it's going to – Neg negatively affect um, reliability. I think it's going to increase, increase costs to consumers and that it's going to have environmental consequences. And one of the things that, that you've highlighted in this is that it's likely to kill the development of nuclear power because of its limited 10-year time frame. Um, yeah, you know, as you pointed out, SEP will have the most significant climate action in our country's history. There's no question about that. Yet it passed out of the ENC in the markup and, uh, you know, during the markup um, and really never had a, a single hearing by itself as it should have. And I, this is important to me because Plant Vogel, one of the, where we have two of the only nuclear reactors under construction currently in the country. It sits right outside my district in Georgia. And Plant Vogel, once it goes online, it'll provide Georgia with reliable, clean energy for up to 60 to 80 years. 60 to 80 years, clean, reliable energy. It'll power over 500,000 homes, and that would be the equivalent of being carbon-free, and it would be the equivalent of, of removing over 1 million cars from the roads each year. And to me, that's an incredible investment. I just want to ask you, how would SEP affect the development, in your opinion, how would SEP affect the development of nuclear energy in our country, since it's the only reliable emission-free source of energy in our country? Well, thank you for the question. You know, the, 
The difficulty with SEP is that, again, it's a, it's a solution to a Senate process problem. And so as a consequence, um, you know, where there be uh, an opportunity to actually have input from all stakeholders, you would try to build in more time. Think about um, by, by having to comply with this within that budget scoring window, you are, you are basically picking winners and losers. And the winners will be solar, not, nothing wrong with solar, but and maybe some wind just to be able to meet the SEP requirement so you don't have to pay a penalty. Now, two technologies that we really worry about, what's going to happen over the next 10 years of, you know, the nuclear breakthroughs that we have, these, we may never, uh, unless economic conditions change, we really might not build another Vogel plant um, uh, in the United States as we're headed now, but we may very well build small modular reactors. Now, we we're, we have some planned out west, uh, at DOE, uh, you know, we've been trying to get the new scale project built in Ida, um, Idaho. And recently, we shouldn't forget fusion. The Department, uh, the Office of Science within the Department of Energy has made some recent breakthroughs in fusion. We've almost kind of forgotten about fusion, but ultimately, if we can harness fusion, imagine no more water pressure reactors, right? Um, no more fission. So what happens, what happens during the SEP period? Right? Are we forcing all our technological dollars to go and try to figure out how it is that we can get more uh, solar and more wind? You know, by by improving you know the transmission and and get the upgrades. But and and just one other thing on on nuclear, because uh, the, the Patagonia witness said some interesting things. You know, when I was over at the department, um, and, and not many people really uh, know about this, but you know, in the United States, we were pro or, or against nuclear. But you know, when you step back and look at what's going on in the world, right now, the U.S. is the world's leader in, tech, in nuclear technology. And we have a statutory obligation that if we share any of this real, this great technology, we have to have 123 agreements, non-proliferation and non-enrichment for weapons. Well, what we see, and countries are coming to us and say, please, we would like to build more nuclear because the IEA has said, if you really want to meet uh, your climate uh, uh, restrictions, you ought to look at nuclear. Invest now in over the 40 to 80 years, you'll have emission uh, yeah. clean energy. Right. Um, Thank so you. So, but, but Russia and China do not have 123 agreements, and they will get this technology yeah. somewhere else. And so that's if you're anti-nuclear. We're going to have to move on. About that. Fascinating conversation. Um, and, and I know we'll, we may have some chance for secondary follow-up. Um, uh, Mr. Graves, I think you are now up for a, a secondary round of questions, should you have any. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Kenna, I want to clarify my question earlier because I think we, we cross wires a little bit. I was specifically asking about, so do you believe that, that if we provide federal energy subsidies to companies such as uh, solar uh, energy, wind energy, the that they should have to abide by uh, a certification of, of no slave labor as a condition for being eligible for those funds. I apologize if, if, uh, if that didn't come across the right way. No, that's okay. And, and thank you for clarifying. I, I think I'll stick to what I know here, which is our own supply chain though. And I'm it's glad just, to get back to you on that. But um, I, certainly with our with our own supply chain, we have taken a very strong stance against slave labor um, and work very hard to ensure that we keep up to that commitment. Do I need to close out? Um, thank you. And, and look, I, I think I've easily got thousands of dollars worth of worth of y'all's products. Um, having spent a lot of time uh, leading wilderness trips for, for many years, um, but, but I also I uh, want to be clear that, I, that I've been very disappointed in seeing the companies stepping out into areas just like you said. You said staying in your lane and, I, and watching Patagonia step out there in areas where I think they have no expertise. Um, for example, the comment about nuclear. Um, you know, when California recently shut down the nuclear power plant, they had to send a letter requesting that they be allowed to violate their emissions uh, standards because they're going to have to produce electricity from energy. The uh, United States has the, uh, one of the cleanest uh, natural gas sources in the world. Uh, we have reduced uh, emissions better than any other country in the world and better than the next 12 emissions reducing countries because of our transition to natural gas under a tight regulatory regime. And so I, I do think that we need to be very thoughtful about how to proceed in a global direction that results in, in downward emissions. Um, uh, Mr. Menzies, uh, I, I want to ask, um, with, with all of your experience in, in energy policy, um, are you aware of any recommendations that existed prior to a couple of months ago that, that, that mirror uh, the, the SEP? 
Now, as I put in my testimony, you know, there, there have been recommendations of task force looking at this to Congress, some 700 recommendations. The SEP uh, was not involved in that. Um, I happen to have, um, uh, this is a great Bible, uh, certainly for lawyers interested in trying to decarbonize, uh, <laughs> to develop policies, legal pathways to deep, deep carbonization in is the United States. Is there a cliff note version? It's that? over. It's, <laughs> there's no nutshell version of this, uh, as I remind my students. Um, but, you know, nowhere in here, nowhere in here is any SEP. And these are serious-minded people that have been looking at this to try to come up with things like the SEP, but SEP is nowhere. It's not that they're trying to avoid controversial topics. Right. I mean, they they proposed, um, uh, um, you know, carbon taxes. So th they thought of they tried to think of everything they possibly could. And I've looked at this thing and I've shaken it up and down and I just can't find the SEP anywhere in there. So, again, as I said, now, as a former staffer, if we were in a room and the members said, you've got bucket, uh, bucket re budget reconciliation that you have to deal with. Well, we know we have a limited window to divine something that has to raise uh, income's got to be fees because we don't have jurisdiction over taxes. We're not ways and means. So tight time window, typically something that will cause money to come into the Treasury so that you basically can meet the PAYGO requirements so that you don't get 60 votes in the Senate. That's just, This is what this is all about. Thank you. Um, well, all right, sit tight. Um, I'd like to ask the rest of you just while we're waiting on additional members to come. I know we've covered a lot of ground over the past uh, hour or so. Uh, are there other questions that you would like to, to be able to cover or topics maybe that you weren't asked about that you'd like to, to be able to address? Uh, just give you a couple of minutes each. Mr. Thank you, Member Graves. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. I, I guess I would just like to say that that what what Zurich and and from our angle of the of the business community, um, what we need is an orderly transition to net zero. Um, you know, in, in managing risk, we we take the science and engineering of, of risk very seriously. Um, so the 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 message from the IPCC and climate scientists is we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by about 50 percent by 2030. And 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 100% by by 2050. So how the public policies are enacted to get us there is something that that Washington and and and, and the states need to decide in conjunction with the world. Um, but it's crucial if we don't get there, then our economy faces um, ex extreme risk um, from the insurance industry. We we recognize that that risk very uh, acutely. Um, and so, again, we support the work of this committee, um, and and we can't help but stress the urgency of it to to Zurich and, and to the, the insurance industry and to our economy. So, thank you. Sure, and uh, I'd like to answer one of the questions you mentioned earlier as, um, as well. So our company has signed a pledge uh, as part of the Solar Energy Industries Association not to work with forced labor. Um, and I'll just, I'll just say this again, um, Chairwoman Castor mentioned this earlier, in the nine months this year, we spent over $100 billion after disaster after disaster. I don't have, I mean, the wildfires in the West, hurricane after hurricane in the Gulf, you know, flooding in, in, you know, in the Middle Atlantic here in the Northeast. But let's just take a step back. We're at an interesting time in our nation's history. The business community supports clean energy. I was on a conference call today. Um, I'm a board member of the Renewable Energy, Renewable energy Buyers Alliance. We've set forth a new goal of 90% fo focusing on some of the largest companies in the world from all industries, getting to 90% decarbonization by 2030 of the power sector. We also have a great opportunity, and this bill allows for that as well, too, to decarbonize our transportation sector. We go back and look at, you know, we've talked a lot about underserved minority communities. Well, guess what the biggest form of carbon emission is in those communities? It's the transportation sector. And we have the opportunity to look at, you know, putting EVs, uh, charging stations all across this country. And America has really smart businesses. And these smart businesses, particularly automobile manufacturers, are making significant investments in electric vehicles. Almost every car I can think about is going to be have some form of an electric vehicle in the future. And I'll just say, lastly, 
We also have the opportunity to electrify our buildings, federal buildings, commercial buildings, residential buildings across this country. So I just hope that we all um, recognize that we can no longer afford to pay in action um, for all the events that have happened, but we have an opportunity to really grow our economy and, and really prepare ourselves for the, um, the infrastructure that's needed of the future. So thank you. Ms. Kenner. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'll just uh, want to highlight what the my panelists have already said and, and just reinforce this idea that the, the cost of inaction now is um, far greater than any of the investments on the table. Additionally, um, we haven't talked about it a lot today, but one of the things that's on the table here that we feel really strongly about is this Civilian Climate Corps, which we think would really create new job opportunities in rapidly growing clean energy, ecosystem restoration and recreation, restoration and recreation industries for both urban centers and rural communities. And while at the same time, it will inspire a new generation of conservationists and healthy outdoor recreation enthusiasts. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Menzies? Yeah, sure. I have something I'd like to talk about. Um, the, uh, our, uh, the Lawrence Livermore uh, Lab Foundation uh, did a report uh, at the request of California. When California came out with... Um, there, let's get to net zero by 2045. They asked uh, the, the Lawrence Livermore uh, Lab Foundation to actually see, can we do it? And the lab assumed no policy changes, okay? No carbon tax, no federal mandates, just current policy. And so the question was, can we get there, right? They said, we can, you can get there. You don't need Congress to do anything. And you don't have to be anti-fossil. You can accept the fact that we are going to have emissions for as far as we can see. But what can you do and how can you get there? One, put carbon capture technology in all existing facilities that, admit, that emit. We have the technology. Let's do it. Can Congress incent that? Sure, they can do that. You capture it. Now, you got to build pipelines. California has a lot of permanent places to sequester. So they were able to do that too, land management, right? Manage your forest, manage your, uh, your biomass, and guess what? You can make renewable biofuels and you can help reduce the emissions in the transportation sector, okay? Um, um, so, uh, and then finally they looked at everything and they said, you know, with all these reductions, we still need one more thing. We can't quite get there, but you know what we have? We have direct air capture technologies. We have direct air capture technologies that can actually pull CO2 right up the air. We have the technology today. So, and, and Congress has been incenting uh, direct air capture. So together, we have the means to be able to get to the goals uh, that we want. We don't have to have things like this set. We just don't have to come up with these things. So that's, that's really what I wanted to say. Uh, Mr. Moses, see you got a minute left. If you could maybe talk about, I, I've watched as, as you end up having companies that end up spending a gazillion dollars to reduce that last ton of carbon to get to zero. Could you talk about um, with the last 45 seconds or so, should we be doing that and try and focus sector by sector or should we be looking at ways to identify less expensive offsets that are easier well, to Well, that's achieve? right. And environmental action actually proposed a roadmap. It was a combination of a variety of things. It wasn't just the SEP, right? And so when you look at the roadmap, there were all the things that we've been talking about, right? I mean, tax benefits, moving to EVs, for example. It's a very comprehensive piece And that if you have all the other parts in place, you can get to at least 73% of the 80% of the emission targets that's set forth uh, in the environmental uh, action uh, program. So essentially what we're doing is we're, we're going to be spending $150 billion, according to the CRS, on chasing that 7% just to get us to that, um, you know, 80% uh, reduction uh, by 2030. So uh, that's what I have to say about that. I thank the gentleman um, for his questions. I will now recognize myself for uh, uh, questions. Um, Mr. Kenna, uh, a recent study found that the Clean Electricity Performance Program is being proposed as part of the Democrat Reconciliation Bill 
would result in a 45% increase in electricity prices by 2031 Arizona and a nearly 90% increase from 2019 rates if the Palo Verde nuclear plant were to cease operation. Uh, this level rate hike would, would have low income and fixed income seniors struggling to pay their uh, bills to keep the houses warm in the winter. Uh, is it your company's hope by supporting this bill that low income families and fixed income seniors will buy Patagonia jackets to stay warm when they cannot afford to heat their home? Thank you, uh, Congressman. Um, look, I, at the end of the day, we are concerned about the economy and we are concerned about the planet. And the oil and gas markets are volatile by nature and as are their prices. And we think one way to avoid this volatility is to expedite the transition to clean energy, uh, which we think is wind and solar and, uh, and to protect our public lands and to cultivate Nan these na natural climate solutions. Would you like to see the transition uh, to uh, renewable energy similar to what they've done in the UK? Or Europe. Our, in, I mean, our our interest here is in plain water and no, clean I'm air asking, and a healthy if you're, climate. No, if you're really interested in it, then you've kept up with what's going on around the world. Do you recommend that we transition to renewable energy, like they have in Europe and and particularly in the United Kingdom? It's a simple I, yes or no, or either you don't know. I, look, I think the United States has an opportunity to be. Now, a let me tell you, you're, you're, you've been, really you've been coached to filibuster the, the answer. And I'll just tell you, if we transition to renewables the way the UK has, uh, last winter, they, they had 3,000 people die because they couldn't afford to keep their homes warm enough. And uh, that's where we'd head with this. We're already talking about a 40% increase in. Uh, household utility costs just in the United States. And that's gonna be particularly problematic, uh, Mr. Menendez, uh, in, in certain parts of the country. I'd like for you to comment on that. Do you think we should transition like the UK and Europe has? Well, just from the energy point of view, I mean, just what happened um, you know, last month, right? So the UK has embraced wind. They have, uh, they get 25% of their energy from wind. It's a great thing. Um, it, when it runs, it tends to be, uh, cheaper, they've saved a lot of money. Uh, sometimes it produces too much that they can use. But you know, when they, again, and I mentioned this earlier in a question, uh, when you need the electricity uh, is when you want it, right? So mm -hmm. you have to have it. So when the wind stopped blowing uh, last month, um, you saw natural gas prices spike. Uh, they had to import natural gas from Russia and the United States, so that was a good thing. Um, but they had to uh, take uh, run uh, run a coal plant that had been closed due to anti-fossil uh, policies uh, that are there in Europe and in the UK. So, again, as I've mentioned earlier, we we have to develop, you know, the the battery technology or the storage technology to be able to be there when the wind stops blowing and when the sun stops shining. We haven't gotten there yet from a technological point of view. We're not against renewables, but renewables from an engineering perspective, and I worked for two international engineering companies in a previous career, uh, we, we're not there uh, for being able to, to um, convert to renewables because our, our grid's a patchwork grid. It depends on a consistent base load. That's not going to happen. I also want to point out that uh, if we can't go to next generation nuclear, if we uh, can't go to maybe more dependence on natural gas, that it's gonna have an enormously negative impact on, on low income people around the world. There's projections that approximately, uh, because of the, of the energy crisis right now, that there's about 4 billion people who don't have access to cleaner energy. They're cooking their food using wood or, or animal dung, cow dung, um, other combustion materials, which they use inside their homes. There are about 4 billion people whose life uh, expectancy is much shorter because of that. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, places like the Congo and places like that that need energy to develop for the benefit of their people. And um, I, I just would like for you to comment on, on 
how we can justify some of these policies that the Democrats are proposing when it will create enormous harm for people, and not just in, in, in the more impoverished regions of the world, but here in the United States, when you're looking at a 40% increase in household utility costs, and, and they're projecting now that natural gas is going to go to about $10 per million cubic feet, that's, uh, that's going to force some people, particularly elderly people, to make a decision on how much they can spend on their utility bill versus their food and their, their medicine. Is that, does that sound like a, a, a reasonable policy? Excuse me. Uh, even the CRS has identified that ultimately, you know, it is the electric consumer that bear, bears the cost of policy changes in Congress. Uh, and with regard to the SEP, you know, they said we really don't know what the outcome is going to be. You know, with respect to the rest of the world, um, pulling people out of poverty, electricity pulls people out of poverty. Okay? In, uh, in India and in Africa, right, uh, the leaders are trying to bring electricity uh, to their people. And it is the United States technology, typically, which we export to them. And with our policies, we help to put that technology in place. Technology is not limited to the solar or wind, certainly includes all that. But we're trying to also uh, figure out ways to where we can, you know, bring small modular reactors, for example, give them an opportunity, you know, uh, to do that. Uh, and use the U.S. technology. So with the SEP and other policies, it seems like Congress is picking winners and losers. And we haven't even talked about the clean coal technologies that are in existence here. We, we still have an abundance of coal. We can, put clean co we can develop and put clean coal technologies on this, and we can export that technology to the countries that rely mostly on coal. When you look at the International Energy uh, Agency's projections in those developing countries, coal is going to increase. Well, so we, we have to give them options because they will not want to turn away from coal because they want to bring electricity to their people. When you talk about picking winners and losers, uh, I think most of us understand that in the context of, of favoring certain industries over others. But I, I will tell you right now, for the legislation that's before us, the losers are going to be low-income Americans, uh, elderly Americans, uh, people who, who, like I said, are going to be making some really tough decisions this winter about uh, how much they can afford to pay for utility uh, bills versus food and, and medicine. With that, the time has expired. Um, without objection, all members will have 10 business days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses. Ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. Uh, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>